Winning Cures Everything. Now for your hosts, Gary and Chris. Welcome in, Winning Cures Everything. This is the Wednesday, April 14th show. Recording, of course, on Tuesday, April 13th. I'm Gary, riding solo today. Chris is driving across this great country, headed to drop off a piece of machinery. So, that's all that I know about the situation. I'll let him explain it more when he calls on his way back on Wednesday's live show, 3 p.m. Central Time. So, make sure that you are on YouTube for that. We are going to have a good time, of course. Uh, To get us started, of course, there is a lot going on in the world of sports today. We are going to talk about ESPN releasing the FPI Top 25, and there are a few surprises. There are some things that just do not make a whole lot of sense, and we're going to talk about that. Dustin Poirier and Conor McGregor getting into it before their July fight, and is there actually going to be a fight? We're going to talk about that, and I'll have one more topic. We're going to make it a a quicker show, and we're going to discuss the Broncos and the Seahawks and their decision to not do their voluntary workouts at the team facilities. Very interesting. So, we'll talk about all that before we begin. WinningCuresEverything.com is the website. Make sure that you go and check it out. Everything that you need to know about us, everywhere that you need to follow, subscribe, etc., can be found right there. Very easy to do. Uh, All the different places that you can subscribe and watch the show live, watch the video, etc. Obviously, we do a lot of YouTube and our podcast. So, if you are already subscribed, first off, thank you. And second, if you would, share the show out. Tell a friend about it. All that good stuff. If you don't like today's show, that's fine. It's all good. Just don't tell anybody that it happened. Just wait until a good one happens and then tell somebody about it. We can roll with that. We also do a college football show for Sportsbook Review. You can find that very easily on their website, sbrpicks.com slash NCAAF. That's right, NCAA football. Uh, So, Go and check that out, sportsbookreview.com, sbrpicks.com slash NCAAF, or you can just find it on YouTube. Just search out SBR Picks, subscribe to their channel, and you can find our stuff right there. Very easy to do. You can also find it on our website as well, just to make it easy on you. So go ahead and knock that out. There is a link down in the description if you're watching on YouTube or on the podcast. We would certainly appreciate that. Let's dive into the first topic. ESPN's FPI has been released. And, wow, I, I don't really know exactly how they come up with these analytics, right? Basically, what it said is if Vegas released their power lines, this is what it would look like. And I just don't buy that for a second. Let's go ahead and run through the top ten here. Number one, Alabama. No surprise there. Number two, Oklahoma. Number three, Clemson. Okay, I can get with that. Number four, Iowa State. Number five, Ohio State. Number six, Texas A&M. Number seven, Georgia. Number eight, Mississippi State. That's right, Mike Leach and the Bulldogs. Number nine, Oklahoma State. And number 10, Penn State. Now, there are some uh, some big names that are obviously missing from that top 10 list, but that's okay. We are going to dive through this and see what we can figure out. First things first. Number four, Iowa State. According to their numbers on a neutral field, Iowa State would be favored by about two and a half points over Ohio State. Now, I understand. Ohio State loses Justin Fields. They lose some other guys. But as far as recruiting goes and the overall talent base of the program, if you gave me two and a half points with Ohio State over Iowa State, just knowing what I know right this second, I am taking that all day. I would put my mortgage on that. There is no way that I believe that Iowa State is is better or it should be ranked higher at this moment than Ohio State. That's an absurd... Uh, come. I, I, I don't, I'm, I'm speechless. I don't know what to say. That makes no sense. They've got Iowa State at number four. Here are the rankings. Alabama uh, is number one with the FPI rank of 28. They would be a one-and-a-half point favorite, 1.4 point favorite over Oklahoma on a neutral field. They have Oklahoma, 26.6. They would be a 3.1 point favorite over Clemson on a neutral field. They've got Clemson as uh, a little less than one point favorite over Iowa State. And then they have Iowa State as uh, a 2.3 point favorite over Ohio State on a neutral field. I just don't understand that. 
I love what Iowa State is doing, and they return a ton. They've got an experienced quarterback. They've got uh, Brees, Brees Hall, I believe, the running back. They've got all kinds of stuff going in their favor. Matt Campbell is a fantastic coach. But if you just look based on talent alone, along with the fact that Ryan Day is not a bad coach, I'd, I'd go with that. So these analytical rankings, take them for what they are. Don't overthink this. Ohio State is better than Iowa State. It, they just are. It is what it is. Moving on from there, A&M and Georgia at 6-7. and seven, I would probably flip those around. I was a little bit shocked looking at the offensive rank for Texas A&M. They've got Texas A&M number 9 and Georgia number 12. And I understand that Georgia had, has some injuries on the offensive side of the ball. I understand that they lost uh, some running backs at Zamir White and, and whatnot. I, I get it. But just the fact that they bring back JT Daniels and we don't know what we're going to get out of the quarterback situation at Texas A&M, I think uh, the kid King is going to be the starter this year. But I, we don't know that for certain. We don't know what we're going to get from the quarterback position at Texas A&M now that they are replacing a four-year starter in Kellen Mond. So you're telling me that preseason, Texas A&M has a better offensive rank than Georgia. I just don't know that I buy it. Uh, but, I mean, obviously, Georgia has not been great on offense. Like, if you look at the beginning of last season and and you just try and average out those numbers without actually taking into account the fact that they swapped quarterbacks in the middle of the year, okay, that's on you. But uh, I, I would have swapped Georgia and Texas A&M. As far as defensive rankings, they've got A&M number three in the country, Georgia number four. I, that makes sense. I'm good with that. That's, that's totally fine. No big deal. Uh, the next one, number eight. Mississippi State, Mike Leach and the boys, I don't know how you can quantitatively even think that Mississippi State would be a top 10 team going into next season with the way that last year played out. I They were competitive in some games towards the end of the year. Obviously, they had the big win over LSU to start. After that, they were non-competitive for, for weeks on end. And towards the end of the season, they got things kind of turned around and they looked a little bit better. The defense ranked number 18 in the country last year in total defense. Uh, this go-round, they've got them at number six in the country on defense. They do return a lot on that side of the ball, but I don't know that I saw enough on offense to make me believe that Mississippi State, you know, as of this point, they've got them ranked number four in the SEC. And I just don't know what to even think about that. I, I, they, they have State... Um, let's see, at 16.2. So they have Georgia as only a 1.7 point favorite over them on a neutral field. They have Mississippi, uh, Mississippi State as a 1.3 point favorite over Penn State on a neutral. That just doesn't make sense. It doesn't jive with, with what I believe. doesn't make any sense. Uh, moving further down, I've got a couple of other ones that I want to bring up. You know, Penn State at 10, Notre Dame at 11, A&M, sorry, Texas at 12. Uh, Texas, obviously, there's a lot of talent there, but with a new coaching staff coming in, I, we'll see. You know, there's a lot of crazy stuff off the field that goes on at Texas with Sarkeesian coming in. I, I, they'll probably be fine, I would imagine. Would it shock me to see them lose to Louisiana in the first game of the season? Absolutely not. Absolutely not. But uh, Texas at 12, North Carolina 13, Florida 14, Wisconsin at 15. Then you've got Auburn at 16. And that's an interesting one because they lose a lot on the offensive side of the ball. And I understand that they bring in Brian Harson, but when you make a coaching changeover like that, uh, that's that's not something that you can really toss into analytics. So I'm I'm curious, and it's not like Bo Nix looked good the last two years. So I, I don't know what to make of this, but Oregon at 17, LSU 18, TCU 19, Miami 20. What what analytics could you possibly look at? What formula could you come up with that would have Mississippi State as the number eight team in the country? That would not also include Oregon, LSU, Miami, etc. I, I just don't get it. Now, the other surprising one to me was number 21, Texas Tech. They have not looked good at all, at all, under Matt Wells. It, they, they've had a few spots here and there, but overall, just not a great team whatsoever. I don't understand it for the life of me. And on top of that, then you've got Ole Miss at 22, Iowa 23, West Virginia 24, and Indiana 25. I think Iowa's going to be better than people give them credit for. Just a hunch, looking at the schedule, 
you know, and, and no, schedule does not play into power rankings or anything like that. But uh, this was surprising to me a little bit. Indiana at 25, I, I could see that, but they've got them as the number 60 offense in the country. That's how far the numbers fell last season when they lost Michael Penix. Getting Michael Penix back, that offense will certainly be better than 60th. I, I would almost guarantee that. Uh, they've got Ole Miss as the number four offense. They lose some big-time playmakers. I think they're going to have some more, though. I, I, do I trust Lane Kiffin? Absolutely on that side of the ball. Uh, on defense, they're number 83 in the country. Mm. I did have uh, an interesting tweet that a lot of people have been reacting to. If you go follow me on Twitter, at GaryWCE, I, Barrett Salee over at CBS tweeted out who is the biggest threat to Alabama in the SEC West, and he put Texas A&M. And while I do think that A&M is really, really good, I think the team that is most suited to be able to beat them in a one-game setting, if that is, in fact, the question, I guess the biggest threat to win the SEC West could be A&M, but they have not been remotely competitive against Alabama, and I don't know that Jimbo Fisher and the, the style that he coaches will have them in that position this coming season. They're going to have to do a lot on the offensive side of the ball to be able to keep up. I think Ole Miss is the answer to that question. I think Ole Miss is the team that is best suited, depending upon what LSU does with their offense this year and, and really what they can do on defense. Can they slow down Alabama and, and all the stuff that Nick Saban has figured out how to do with that offense with the RPO stuff? Um, I think Ole Miss is the answer to that. I think that they understand how to get under Nick Saban's skin, and you have to have a coach that's willing to do that. The guys that have been able to do it, Gus Malzahn, Lane Kiffin in the past uh, at, at Tennessee. Obviously, he was able to uh, to irk him a little bit. Um, Hugh Freeze, you know, as Steve Spurrier, those kind of guys that can come up with something crazy and you've got guys that can win one-on-one matchups, I think Ole Miss is going to have some of those. So that's who I, be- who I would believe there. But, yeah, the surprises for me, number four, Iowa State, uh, the swap-up of A&M and Georgia at six and seven, number eight, Mississippi State, and then number 21, Texas Tech. Those are the surprises for me in the top 25 for the ESPN FPI. Moving on, let's talk a little UFC. UFC 264 on July 10th. It's supposed to be McGregor versus Poirier 3. I don't know if that's going to end up happening. I, the stuff that came out last night, Monday night into Tuesday, the tweets and everything, of course, McGregor posting out on Twitter, you know, he's he's going to secure a victory, all this kind of stuff. Like, it, it's the typical stuff leading up to a fight. Now, we're only in April. This thing's in July. We got a little time. But they're starting to build up the hype quite a bit, and that might be all that this is. But Dustin Poirier came out and said, that's a fun prediction at Notorious MMA. He said, you also predicted a donation to my foundation, and you and your team stopped responding after the fight in January. See you soon, July 10th, paid in full. And Connor, of course, responds because he always does. He said, a donation, not a debt. We've been awaiting the plans for the money that never came. I do with all my donations. Know where it's going dot for dot. Otherwise, it goes walking. As is the case with a lot of these foundations, sadly, you took the McGregor fight over the belt shows that I was right. Now, there's a lot that has gone on with this and whatnot. There's all these different articles where... Dustin Poirier confirmed that McGregor did actually donate at some point. Um, you know, it, it, Dustin came back, said 100% never a debt. You offered, we accepted, and like I said, your team never responded to our emails regarding the process. Um, he said, of where the funds would be put to work, July 10th, you will taste defeat yet again. And then McGregor calls off the fight, and he went at him. He said, you ripped, you're ripped, you inbred hillbilly. Why do you wink with your ears? You effing brain dead hillbilly $500,000 with no plan in place yeah hang tight fool you must be new to money the fight is off by the way I'm gonna fight someone else on the 10th good luck on your old contract kid so the old contract kid situation that had to do with the fact that McGregor and his bunch his agent everybody else kind of went to bat for Dustin Poirier to get a new contract with UFC to get more money to get all this kind of stuff done right because the the McGregor fight made Dustin Poirier a bigger name it just did. This kind of stuff is bananas. Like, just bananas. And all of that goodwill that we saw, if, if you remember, if, if you actually care about this, of course, leading up to that fight that they had earlier this year, back in uh, uh, February, I guess it was, they were shaking hands and they were hugging each other at the press conference and McGregor was holding up Poirier's hot sauce and he was waving the bottle around and they were... They looked like good old buddies, right? 
And it just seems so weird. And McGregor did the same thing with Cowboy Cerrone, and it's, it is a big-time change from the McGregor that we have always known. And now this is something completely different. This is where McGregor is known for hyping up fights. And in a situation like this, they're going to sell a lot more pay-per-views if this thing actually goes down. Now, McGregor did say in that spot, like, I'm going to fight someone else on the 10th. And the UFC is going to listen to McGregor over Dustin Poirier. They just are. Uh, Poirier had a shot to fight for the, uh, not the interim, but the vacant belt that Habib left behind when he retired. And instead, it was Michael Chandler and Charles uh, Oliveira. Dustin Poirier was up for that, and instead, he chose another Conor McGregor fight. Why? Because of the money. Because the money in that situation matters. And I get it. But man, you, you do something like that, and you start putting this stuff out there about the donation and whatnot, and I understand both sides of it. I get, I get Dustin Poirier wanting that donation because they said they were going to give the donation. I get McGregor wanting to know exactly where the money's going to go. I, there's obviously a miscommunication here, but it's kind of dirty of Poirier to kind of smear McGregor here. But also, I also understand why you would do it. So this kind of stuff, obviously, you're going to pick and choose what side you're on depending upon your bias. If you're a McGregor guy, you're going to be pissed at Poirier. If you're a Poirier guy, you're going to be pissed at McGregor. I get it. But this, like, putting something out there, even McGregor's agent came out and said, yo, that's low. Like, you knew that you were going to get this donation. Like, I, I don't know why you would do this. It's, it's iffy. It's iffy. So I'm curious whether or not this fight is actually going to go out. Uh, Michael Chandler, who has only one fight in UFC, he came up from, from uh, Bellator, he has come out and said, yo, I got this fight in May against Charles Oliveira. For the belt, once I win that belt, I'll come back in two months and, and I'll fight you, McGregor. I, I wouldn't hate that. I would love to see it. So, you know, we'll see exactly what happens. But that is, uh, that's some crazy stuff going on in the world of UFC. And, and I love it. I, we, we needed more of this. I mean, it is just, uh, it, it's crazy to see this kind of stuff considering what we saw from these two guys not that long ago where they looked like they were, uh, respectful and all that, but I don't know that a lot of fans knew what to make of a respectful Conor McGregor. Now, is there a chance that maybe he did not give the donation because he got beat and he kind of held it over Poirier's head to make sure that he got a third shot? Maybe, but in, in $500,000, that's a lot of money. That is a lot of money. You can absolutely do a lot of good with that with the Good Life Foundation, but I don't know. I don't know what to make of it, and I, I would tell you this. I really hope that the fight happens now because I really think that we are going to see some bad blood in the octagon, and that is the kind of stuff that I am after. That's what I want to see out of the UFC. I want to see some crazy stuff go down. All right, finally, we will close on this topic here. The Denver Broncos and the Seattle Seahawks are not going to report to voluntary offseason workouts. The statements... Uh, noted a lack of adequate protocols in place to make sure that they are safe in the facilities. Uh, sources told ESPN the players voted to take this action and notified Coach Vic Fangio, these are the Broncos, of course, earlier Tuesday morning that the vote had taken place. The Seahawks players issued a similar statement in which they noted the NFLPA has provided us with thorough research and information regarding our safety as players as we voluntarily uh, inter workouts this year, especially the benefits on our health and safety from a virtual offseason last year. After considering all the facts, we as a team have decided to make a decision that is uncomfortable but necessary. And there are memes and there are jokes going around on social media, Twitter, Instagram, etc., about, oh, these guys are lazy and they know they can get away with it now, so they don't want to come in and work. And da, da, da. Look, there are plenty of videos and everything of these players actually still out practicing, throwing the ball around getting their workouts in, all that, they're just not going to go to the team facility and report for the voluntary workouts. And part of me gets it, right? If things have not been done uh, that would make you feel safe coming into work, then I get it. I am not as afraid of this virus as some people are, but I don't have the same health risks. I don't have the same family situations as these guys. So all of the jokes about them being lazy, I don't buy that. On the other side, um, 
these are two teams that don't have to worry about bonuses and whatnot being taken away from their contracts. The uh, the Seahawks decision is is easy because it, like the the Green Bay Packers put uh, off season workout bonuses into their contracts. The Seahawks don't. Um, a safety Quadre Diggs, um, Quadre Diggs has a hundred thousand dollar workout bonus in his. But that contract came from the Detroit Lions that he did with them in uh, in 2019. Um, that he's the only Seahawks player whose contract includes a workout bonus, according to roster management system. Like it, maybe this is a little bit easier for these two teams, but uh, you know it is what it is. The statement from the Broncos, by the way, with offseason programs starting in less than a week and without adequate protocols in place in order for us players to return safely. We'll be exercising our right to not participate in voluntary off-season workouts. Uh, the statement read in part, COVID-19 remains a serious threat to our families and our communities, and it makes no sense for us as players to put ourselves at risk during this dead period. Positivity rates in our city are higher than they were at this time last year, and we know players have been infected at club facilities in recent weeks. Despite having a completely virtual off-season last year, the quality of play across the NFL was better than ever by almost every measure. Now, I don't know that I would say that necessarily. Uh, that seemed like something that you you probably could have left out because it's it's very interesting. If you want to just try and look at stats and all that kind of stuff, you can look at it from both sides. You can look at it and say, uh, well, you know, the defense played better and da 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 or the offense played better and da da Well, I don't know that it was better uh, by almost every measure. I don't know that the quality of play was better last year with no – preseason games, and no off-season workout and all that kind of stuff. I do think that having people test positive and and they got the virus from the team facility, that's kind of a big deal, right? We have not heard much about this, but that's, that's still kind of a big thing. Not everybody has been vaccinated just yet. A lot of these players, I would imagine, have not had the opportunity just yet to be vaccinated. So until they are... I get it. I totally understand it. I would imagine that once we get into the summer, all that kind of stuff, we, once we get to OTAs, uh, we, we will have this sorted out and everybody will be reporting where they need to be reporting. I would imagine the protocols will go into place easily. Um, there's a reason they call this quote-unquote voluntary workouts, but hmm, uh, we all know that they're not totally voluntary, but it, neither here nor there I don't see a problem with this. If you can get away with it, get away with it. If it's not in your contract, why worry with it? I I think that they're going to be just fine. This is interesting, if nothing else. But it was quite the headline, and it did stir up quite a bit of conversation. So, I was interested in it. I wanted to talk about it, and we got that done. We are going to talk about quite a bit more. I'll probably bring this up with Chris when he calls in on his trip back tomorrow. So... We will have more conversation about it. If you want to join us on that, of course, 3 p.m. Central Time on Wednesday will be our live show on YouTube, Periscope, Twitch, Facebook, etc. Make sure that you are subscribed where you need to be subscribed so that you can be notified when we actually go live. Make sure that you jump in. You can jump in the chat. You can do all that kind of stuff. Uh, If you would like to leave any comments, of course, if you're on YouTube, go ahead and do that. If you are listening on the podcast, make sure and leave a nice five-star review. That would help us out quite a bit. Uh, We cannot tell you thank you enough. We can't tell you how much we appreciate you listening to the show on the regular. The numbers are growing. They always are. And we appreciate you for that. Share the show out. Tell your friends all that good stuff. Go to winningcureseverything.com. Go to sbrpicks.com slash NCAAF. And of course, down in the description, you can click the link and it will take you over to SBR's YouTube page. And you can find our college football show that will be out on Wednesday as well. Let's go ahead and get out of here. Make it a short show. But again, We appreciate you guys. Take care of yourself, take care of each other, and hopefully all of your tickets cash this week. Thanks for checking out Winning Cures Everything. If you want to keep up with us, hit subscribe on YouTube or your favorite podcast app. Visit the website at winningcureseverything.com or you can like us on Facebook or follow us at Winning Cures, at Gary WCE, or at Chris B. Giannini on Twitter. Share out the show, leave a nice review, and make sure to comment and tweet at us.